responses that I got. So it was pretty lengthy. You'll we'll have to tell me later, Hannah. Okay. Hannah, yeah, was Hannah was in the middle of something and he just took her right out. We, we were having such a good conversation. <laughs> <laughs> We all, I feel like I took up too much time. I'm so sorry. You didn't. No, what happened was I was trying to fix DJs, and I hit the wrong button, and I was just like, well, I guess I'm going to go with it. So <laughs> I'll try to get you guys out. So how, how was your conversations, Kenny? Yeah. 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 Okay. I'll make it um, you can just take a picture of it. Okay. Take a picture of it and send it to me. That's fine. All right. Cool. All right. Well, or I'll read it at the end. Okay. That's fine. Um, really, like I said, what's the whole purpose of this course? It's so that you will start to communicate with others and that you will start to build up the confidence that, that is needed in the world we're living in today, right? So, uh, again, if, you, if you're not confident with speaking about the Word of God with like-minded individuals, how are we ever going to go out there and speak to somebody who, who is not like-minded, right? Um, and I know that's kind of a loaded question because sometimes it's scary to talk to somebody who's like-minded, right? Like if I'm having a conversation with DG, sometimes I'm like, man, this guy just knows way more than me, right? And so is he going to judge me based on what I do know or what I don't know? So it can get kind of convoluted in that regard, right? But remember, this is all about edification. It's about building each other up. So did anybody hear anything different than what they put, or was it all pretty much common? It was pretty common. Did anybody, get, like, hear somebody and was like, wow, I didn't even think of that, DG? I, I Yeah, I'm going to want that. I'm going to want that. So uh, you got to turn it in. <laughs> we'll make a copy before you leave. So what, what Kenny did was he went through um, Luke, the apostle Luke, or the, the writer Luke, and, and kind of who were all the people he spoke to. That's pretty awesome uh, where you got that. I'd like to find out where you got that. Right there in your Bible. There you go. That's all. Ryrie Study Bible. Okay. Um, how about anybody on, on the line? Anybody want to share anything? We mostly talked about salvation and, and walking with the Lord. Uh, so we really didn't get to the assignment, but it was a really great conversation. That's awesome. Yep. That, you, you don't really hear a teacher say, you didn't do what I said. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's awesome. <laughs> what? Oh, man. No, that's good. I'm sorry to break up your conversation. Um, so tonight, if you, if you noticed, uh, we're going through a progression, right? The first week, we defined apologetics. Why do we need apologetics? Last week, we talked about the inspiration of Scripture. And there was a reason why I, I chose the inspiration of Scripture. Really, when you think about it, that is the, the linchpin, right, of our Christian faith, right? If you, if you can defend the inspiration of Scripture, you can now defend any other um, Christian view, based on that. Why? Because we have, we have defended where our authority comes from, right? And the authority comes from the scriptures, right? And so tonight, it's a similar thing we're discussing, but we don't have to redefend the inspired word of God, right? We already defended that, right? So we're not going to go through an apologetic to say, hey, why is this the inspired word of God? Now what we're doing is why are the 66 books that we have in our Christian Bible, what makes them the Bible? What makes them the inspired word of God? All right. I am very confident in saying that the 66 books in our Bibles are indeed the books that God has inspired. Right? And so there's a lot of other books out there that um, claim to be divine, claim to be authoritative, but have not been recognized as canon of scripture, right? And, and so I'm not going to talk to you about why they're not in, all right? I, I think that would be another lesson for another time, maybe apologetics too, right? Then we can start talking about why they're not in. 
But what I want to do tonight is I want to look at what books are in, and I want to discuss why are they in. Does that make sense? So we're, instead of giving a negative apologetic, we're going to give a positive one tonight. So we're going to discuss the canon of Scripture. So everybody has their notes, I'm assuming, right? Everybody got them? So um, would somebody like to read? It's, it's a pretty lengthy opening. Uh, but would somebody like to read? Pastor John, would you mind reading that introduction? I wouldn't mind at all. Awful. As soon as I get there. <laughs> As soon as I put my glasses on. Wait, wait. Aren't you like a teacher like all your life? And like you, you the worst I had to uh, make the worst I, students. I had my classmate to uh, hand me my binder. You didn't have a binder, right? My dog ate my binder. <laughs> you, wait, you don't even have a dog. The <laughs> neighbor's dog. Oh, my neighbor's dog. Jim yeah. McCartney's coming to your rescue. He's <laughs> Superman in that way. The authority of scripture is frequently attacked, no doubt, by the enemy, who is the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, Ephesians 2.2. 2. A main tactic that Satan has used since the beginning of creation is that of twisting God's word and tempting sinners to be like God. When Eve was tempted in the Garden of Eden, and she told the serpent that she was not to eat from the tree, he replied, you will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil, Genesis 3, 4 through 5. That same tactic is still being employed today as he is working to cause seeds of doubt that the scripture is not truly the inerrant and infallible word of God. The Apostle Paul attests to the authority of scripture in that all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, 2 Timothy 3.16. Lee Martin McDonald President Emeritus and Professor of New Testament Studies at Acadia Divinity College states, no credible person today seriously believes that the Bible fell out of heaven fully bound in its current state with gilded pages and with a highly precise interpretation from God in it. Um, so, so that was a lot of words that I put together for you guys, right? Um, but really, if you're noticing... The introduction here is, is really we're attacking why, right? Why do we need to know what the canon of scripture is? And, and we're getting into it. And it really starts with, and I believe, um, I'm very um, confident in saying this, that almost everything in our lives right now is a spiritual battle. Um, I, I think when we look outside the, the doors, when we're opening up the, um, the news, when we're turning it on, we are seeing spiritual battle after spiritual battle after spiritual battle. And really, Satan has one game plan, right? And it's to attack the authority of God, right? And that's how he started with um, he started with Eve in the garden, right? Surely you will not die. God doesn't want you to do it because you're going to become like him. Who doesn't want to become like God, right? And isn't that the essence of sin anyway, right? It's when we become a God unto ourselves, right? And so what, what goes on is Satan is using that same tactic today. Right? And he's been using that same tactic ever since the canon of Scripture was closed. He is trying to get you as believers to, to not believe the Bible to be true. He's trying to get you to say, God didn't write this. Right? And, and that's when we started talking about last week how, how you view Scripture. How you view Scripture is going to determine the course of your life. Amen? And so... Um, Lee Martin McDonald said, he said, no credible person today seriously believes that the Bible fell out of heaven, fully bound in its current state with gilded edges and with a highly precise interpretation from God in it. Like nobody believes that the Bible just fell down from heaven just like this, right? Right? And so that's what we proved last week. The Bible didn't just fall from heaven like this. But that begs the question, how did we get to this? 
right? And everybody else has a Bible. If you lift up your Bible, how many of us have the same Bible, right? So we all have different Bibles, right? Some of us might have different translations, right? But they're all bound differently. How did we get to where we are today, right? And so that's what we're going to do. So this begs the question, how do we recognize the scriptures as the word of God? How do we recognize the scriptures as the word of God? How were they transmitted Are they authoritative? And finally, how was the canon realized? That's what we're really after tonight, isn't it? Right? That, how, how do we recognize the scriptures of the, as the word of God? How are they transmitted? How are they, are, are they authoritative? And how are they realized? That's what we're going to be discussing tonight. Um, as we go further. So the first thing I want to do with you is I want to define canon. Defining the canon. So this isn't canon, C-A-N-N-O-N, -N -N, right? This is canon, C-A-N-O-N, -N, right? One goes boom. One is the canon of scripture. It's the closed set of books, right? So this does not have two ends in the middle. It has one end in the middle, all right? And to really get this, we need to understand I didn't even know we had a phone in this church. Do you guys hear the phone going off? Mm -hmm. John, somebody might be calling you. Uh, I, don't, I don't know. Probably. Somebody get the phone. Huh? Somebody get the phone. <laughs> All right, so, so there's two words that we, need to do, that, that we need to define together to really understand the canon. And the first word is scripture. The first word is scripture, and that comes from the Greek word graphe, and it's divine, defined as a writing, a passage of scripture, or the scriptures. No, this is going to be a long message, I think. Do you hear it? It's like, it's like insurance companies saying, hey, you need to up your insurance. Oh, talk about... Yeah. Yeah. Uh, maybe, maybe they're trying to sell us a warranty for our car or something. Um, so it's graphe. And, and so what this refers to is the, the writings, the, the writings which are penned by the authors of the Bible as they were inspired by the Holy Spirit. And that same McDonald, he proposes that there's four fundamental principles for the scriptures. There's four. And the first one is the scriptures are a written record. They're a written record. And as you're writing that down, I just want to say praise God that he gave us the written record. Amen? Amen, right? God has given us the written record. They are divine in origin, right? We spoke about that last week. They convey the will and truth of God. And this fourth one is perhaps one of my favorite purposes. They serve as a continual means of practice and living. What, is, what does he mean by they serve as a continual means of practice and living? I, th I think he's taking it right out of Hebrews. The, the word of God is alive and active, right? It it's, it's cuts down through the through the bone and marrow, straight to the heart, right? It's alive and active. And um, when I think of that, I think I, ought to, I always go back to this. You know, there are times where I've read a certain passage one day and I got something out of it. And then there's times where I've come back in another situation and I've gotten something entirely different, right? And both interpretations were very valid, right? And so, so the word of God, is, it, it's, it's, a, it's a breathing document almost, right? It's, it's, it's God breathed. So it, not almost, it is. It's God breathed. And so God is speaking to each of our different situations through his word. And so that's what he means by it's a continual means. 
of practice and living. And so if you want, highlight that, because I think that's, that's fantastic. All four of them are. It's the written record. It's divine in origin. They convey the will and truth of God, and they're continual in their practice, serve as continual means of practice and living. So that's the first word, scripture. Is there any question as to what scripture refers to when we talk about scripture? Good. I got to get used to looking down at the screen. Uh, the second word to be defined is canon. Canon. Canon is taken from the Greek word canon, <laughs> which originally meant a reed, which was used to test for straightness or length. So think about it. It's a reed that tests for straightness or, or length. Um, when I said that, Brother G George looked up at me with a smile because he knows about reeds. He knows about testing things for straightness and length, right? Um, but in this case, it, it's, it, it came to symbolize the mean rule, standard, or norm, right? So when we're talking about the canon of Scripture, we're, we're talking about the rule, the standard, or the norm of Scripture. And according to F.F. F. Bruce... In the 4th century, the 4th century, that's a 4 with a TH, um, the 4th <laughs> the century, Athanasius, Bishop of Alexandria, was the first known writer to have used the term canon as applied to both Old Testament and New Testament. So um, how many of us understand, what, what is the 4th century? 325. Three, in the 300s, right? So in the 300s was the first time that the word canon um, that we know of probably could have been used before that. And I'm, I, I would be willing to guess that it would have been. Uh, but it was used by Athanasius to recognize the Old Testament and the New Testament. So by the 4th century AD, the Old Testament and the New Testament was realized. Right? The canon was closed. Right? The canon was closed, and that's really important for us to know. How many of us can go and write something today and say, hey, this should be in the scripture? The correct answer is none of us, right? None of us. It, you know, um, George Whitfield actually said it this way. If God has given you um, a word or whatever, and, and so he says it this way. If God has given you a revelation, if it's already in the scripture, it's it's meaningless. It's pointless to give it to you. And if it's not in the scripture, it's heresy, right? God, God has spoken. He's spoken once. His canon of scripture is closed. So in the fourth century, this happened. Um, D, Doug, uh, D. A. Carson and Douglas Moo, they said, the canon has come to refer to the closed collection of documents that can cons constitute authoritative scripture. So what are they? They're the 66 books that make up the Old and New Testament. That, which means the 39 Old Testament books and the 27 New Testament books so, that are in our Christian Bible. And notice I keep, I keep saying Christian Bible, right? Because there are other um, Bibles. The Hebrew Bible does not have the New Testament, right? But it will have all of the Old Testament. It's different divisions, but it has what we have. Our Old Testament is the Hebrew Bible, right? But the Catholic Bible, they have apocryphal um, literature in there. The apocryphal literature, we're not really going to touch about that, right? Because I said I wasn't going to give a negative defense, right? I was only going to give a positive. But just so you know, the apocrypha was only added after the Protestant Reformation, which was in the 1500s, right? So the apocrypha was never recognized as scripture. It was never recognized, not to say that they weren't historical records, right? That, that's like um, we have history books today, right? And these history books today, they, they, they recount history, history accurately, right? But we don't say that they're divinely inspired, right? And we don't say that they're for the church. That's very similar to First and Second Maccabees was very historically accurate, right? But all of, all of the prophets, all, uh, the Jews actually understood that about 400 B.C., before Christ, the, the, the God did not speak through the prophets. There was a 400-year where God did not speak, 400-year win, window where God did not speak. So when we're talking about the, the Scripture, we're talking about 39 books in the Old Testament, 
27 in the New Testament. Any questions? Good. So the Old Testament canon. First, we will examine the Old Testament, and we begin by looking at the historical framework. The historical framework given to us in the Bible itself. So God is so good that he even had the writers hold history, right? They, they recorded history all throughout the scripture, right? And there was a historical framework built inside the scripture to show us what is divinely, divine in origin and, and what would not be, right? So our litmus test really comes from the Bible itself. The Bible authenticates itself. Right? Charles Spurgeon once says, you know, you're trying to defend the gospel. You're trying to defend the Bible. W what are you doing? Let, let the Bible loose. Trying to defend the Bible is no, no worse than uh, trying to defend a lion. What do you do with a lion? You let the lion out of the cage and he'll deal with it himself, right? And then that's, that's really what the word of God does. So God first begins by handing the first five books to who? Moses. Moses. So, and, and we call this the law, or we call this the Pentateuch, right? The Pentateuch. Um, he then handed the law to who? The Jewish people. And it was the Jewish people that, that transmitted it down from generation to generation. And we're going to fast forward a little bit, because one of these scribes that... So, so what they would do is these Jewish people would often be scribes, um, but they were also Pharisees and Sadducees. And so it's interesting to know that God used people that he pretty much condemns in the New Testament, right? Jesus comes and says, you Sadducees, you Pharisees, you scribes, you're a whole bunch of sinners, right? But God used them to preserve his word all the way through, right? And so because he did that, they, they built up pride in themselves because we're the ones who have been used to bring about God's word and preserve God's word, right? And so, I, you know, when you really think about it, it would be very hard, Kenny, if you were a scribe, it would be very hard not to be proud. It would be, right? If we're being honest, wouldn't it be really hard, right? And so these scribes would meticulously preserve the scripture, right? And I, I don't think I put this in there and I forgot to put it in there, but... God actually tells Moses in Deuteronomy, did you know that one of the things God foretold that there would be a kingdom, right? And what were the kings to do with the law? Anybody? They were to read it and they were to write it down. They were to write their own copy, right? And that, that got lost along the way. But then you have people like Hezekiah who, who find out the word and they say, whoa, where was this? You know, um, but that it was prescribed that the, the kings would have to write this, the Pentateuch by hand. And they would have, well, obviously by hand. <laughs> you know, they weren't using computers then. Um, they weren't using copy machines. But uh, they would have to write it by hand. Did you know that, Harry? So they had to write it by hand. Why would God do that? You know, I, I know this is, we're talking about the canon, but I think this is a good teachable moment, right? Why would God have the, the kings write this down? So they would know it. So that they would know it, right? Pretty simple. So that you would know the statutes of the Lord, you would know the, what God commands of you, and that you would exude righteousness and judgment correctly, right? Um, and so one of these scribes who, who was called to write it down was actually Ezra. So Ezra, and, and God, raised, he, he raised Ezra up for this task. And we're first introduced to Ezra in the beginning of Ezra 7. And what we know about Ezra, he came from a long line of priests. Came from a long line of priests. Do you know what priests he, he went all the way back to? Aaron. Who? Aaron. Yep, Aaron. So he came from a long line of priests going all the way back to Aaron or Aaron. That's how I know that it's two A's every time. Uh, himself, the high priest. We also re read that Ezra was living among the exiles in Babylon. So he was living in the, 
among the exiles in Babylon. So what was happening is Ezra is getting called to, to reestablish, um, recommit the Israelites to the law, but he's in exile in Babylon at the time. But we also know that he was a scribe skilled in the law of Moses. And, and so God was, you know, I, I always think of God is always working on his remnant, isn't he? He's always raising up his remnant, and he's always doing it for a reason. Um, and so with Ezra, he's in Babylon, but God's going to call him out, all right? And Ezra had gained knowledge of the word of God. In fact, the rabbis considered him second only to Moses. So speaking of Moses again, did Moses um, proclaim that there were going to be more coming behind him that were actually going to be better than him, Right? Didn't he say, God's going to raise up a prophet like me, but better than me, right? So Moses actually, um, that, that's one of those less of me, more of him moments, correct? And so Ezra was coming behind him, and I, I wouldn't say that Ezra was better than Moses. We wouldn't say that. Uh, but the rabbis considered him to be second only to Moses. So there was Moses, and then there was Ezra. And, and I would say that that's pretty convicting, to somebody like myself who, who has never really given the study of, of Ezra um, the benefit, right? I, I never did a really in-depth study of Ezra. I, his counterpart, Nehemiah, love him, right? But Ezra, I've never really looked into him. And so that's kind of convicting to me to say, hey, let me go back and study Ezra a little bit more, right? And so what Ezra was doing, he, um, he was skilled in the scriptures. And the scriptures at that point, was the law, which is also the Pentateuch, right? So the first five books. The Pentateuch. The law or Pentateuch, however you want to put it. So... So Ezra was kind of um, the first scribe to really start to translate the, the word. But then, not translate the word, that's not what I meant, to transmit, right? To copy it down. But then down the road, God raised up a group of, of people, all right? And, and they, they were later scribes known as the Masoretes. Masoretes, and I'm going to write that down so that you guys know how to spell it. That might happen. M-A-S-O-R-E-T-E-S. All right. And so we're going to talk a little bit about them. We're not going to talk a great deal about them. You guys can go and look them up. It's a fascinating story what they, what they accomplished. But they developed a number of strict measures to ensure that every fresh copy was an exact rep rep uh, reproduction of the original. Right. And so what they would do is they would take one copy they would take the original and they're writing a copy. And one of the things that they would do is at the end of every book, they would write down how many verses, they would write down how many uh, words, and then they would write down how many letters, right? And so they all had to match up or else they had to go back and either fix it or get rid of it, right? That's how strict it was, all right. And so they were very meticulous. The, they were Jewish scribes and they were scholars. And they made it their life's work to accurately copy the Hebrew Bible. And the reason I'm bringing this up is because the Masoretes, the, the works that they copied are what's important, right? Now, how they did it is very important. How they did it is very beneficial for you and I. But really, I want to look at what books did they do it for, right? Because this was the first ones. This was really um, the close of the Old Testament canon came through them, right? And I don't want to say that because the close of the Old Testament canon was testified by Jesus Christ. And that's our biggest one. Um, but I'm jumping the gun here, all right? And so um, the, the name the Masoretes came, so they primary. I got to so they, they were really in the 600 to, uh, 600s to 950 AD, but primarily in the areas of Jerusalem, Tiberias, and Babylonia. So they were dispersed. It came during the dispersia. Um, 
And really what they were doing was um, the name Masoretes comes from the Hebrew word Masora, which means tradition or to hand down. So they took it upon themselves to take the, the, the tradition or the handing down of the scriptures and they took it upon themselves to, to copy the scriptures. Um, I'm going to skip down because you guys can read this at your own leisure. But the early Masoretes were determined to make accurate copies of the Hebrew Bible and they went to elaborate lengths to ensure mistakes are not made. And I'm going to ask DG if you wouldn't mind reading what John Barry says. John Barry states, as part of their goal to preserve and accurately transmit the text, the Masoretes offered notations at the end of each book called Masora Finales. That provided critical information to ensure an accurate, accurate transmission. The Mazura finales included information such as the number of verses, words, and letters given to the book. So really what it included, and, and really that was, that was just a, a major way to check and balance, right? So not only are they checking as they're going, did I copy this word, word to word, but at the end of a book, so after Genesis, they wrote down how many verses are in the book of Genesis? Um, I saw, I think it was 1335, 1,335, right? Um, I, I should have gotten you guys numbers. That would have been so much better. But uh, so th they start with the verses. How many verses are there? Then from there, they go to how many words, right? So you see how it's starting bigger, verses, words, and then letters. And so they would have that accounted for after every time that they um, every time they copied a scripture, they would write that down, right? That, that's how meticulous they were. Um, I don't know how many of you guys have ever tried to copy down a book. You know, I was, I was challenged one time, and I was like, let me start with a small one. And I got tired after the first chapter. Like, I think I was going First Thessalonians. I started copying it down, and I made it to, like, First Thessalonians 2, and I was like, this is too much. I made so many errors. Um, it was just, it was really hard. It was really hard work to, to meticulously write it down. Um, the challenge was write a couple chapters, go back and see how many errors you had. Well, I had a lot of errors, but I also have ADHD, so um, that could be why. No, I'm just kidding. So, so now we're going to get to really what I think is the, the, the good part here. The Masoretic text of the Hebrew Old Testament contains 24 books. How many, of you, how many books are in our Old Testament? 39. Does 24 equal 39? No. no. So off the bat, you know, when you're reading this, you're like, uh-oh, where are these other books coming from, right? There's 15 books missing, right? Well, what's interesting is these 24 books, they start with Genesis and they end with 2 Chronicles, but these 24 books are actually the same 39 books that we have. They just use different divisions than we do. And so I'm going to explain the divisions for you guys. And then you're going to see, oh, wow, the, the 24 books that they recognize are actually the 39 books that we recognize. So the first one is, the so we're going to look at the three divisions. The first division is the law, or Kenny, your favorite word of the night, the Pentateuch, right? And how many books is the law or Pentateuch? Five. In our Bible, the law and Pentateuch are five books. Guess how many books are in the Masoretic text? Five. So it's the same then and the same now, right? No discrepancy whatsoever there. The prophets, however, in their book, it's eight books, right? In their text, it's eight books, but in ours, it's 21 books. That seems like a big difference, doesn't it? Right? Sounds like a big difference, but I'm going to explain that difference, right? So... The way it's explained is the, the, the four books here, the first four books are the former prophets. The former prophets. And this was originally four books, but it became six books when it came to the Christian Bible, right? And look at why. These books are Joshua, Judges, I'm missing one, Samuel. 
No, I got them. Joshua, Judges, Samuel 1 and 2, and Kings 1 and 2. Do you see what happened? In the Masoretic text, there, Samuel and Kings are just one book. But when we read, right, and, and we listen to Donald Trump at some point, he says one Chronicles or something, right? We split up Kings and Samuel as two different books, right? So in their original text, it's four books, but in our Bible, we just broke it up into six books. Still the same text, but a different number of books. Do you see that? So now we're, we're, we're bridging the gap, right? Bridging the gap. So then that was the former prophets. So the opposite of the former prophets is the latter prophets. L-A-T-T-E-R, prophets. And this is where really we, we get the really big gap that comes back together. This was originally four books, but now it's 15 books, right? So the first ones we have are the major prophets. Who are the major prophets? You guys can be a little bit more confident, right? Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. They're the three major prophets, right? And then we have the minor prophets, which... This is what the Masoretic text did. They put all the minor prophets and put them into one book, right? But in our Bibles, all of these minor prophets have their own books, right? So again, it's the same material, it's the same text, but we have a different division. So what we have is, it's originally one book where it lumps them all together and just says minor prophets. But what we have is Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi, right? So we're, we're bridging the gap even more. And then the third division is the writings. And the writings contains 11 books for the Masoretic text, but now it's 13 books. So the first of the writings was the poetical, poetical. And that includes Psalms, Proverbs, and Job. Then the second one is the rolls, R-O-L-L-S, the rolls. And that contains five books, Song of Solomon, Ruth, Lamentations, Ecclesiastes, and Esther. And then the last division was historical. And this is where we brought the gap all together. They have originally three books. The first book was Daniel. The second book was Ezra, Nehemiah. But is, do we have Ezra and Nehemiah in our Bibles? Or do we have Ezra and Nehemiah, their own separate books, right? So we separate them. And then they have Chronicles as one book, but we have Chronicles as two books. So down at the bottom, if you notice, let's go down the list. The Pentateuch, we both agree that it was five, right? So put a five in that first. Here's your math lesson for the day, right? Five plus how many prophet books of the prophets do we have now? 21. So 5 plus 21 is 26. Plus how many of the writings do we have? 13, right? 5 plus 21 is 26. 26 plus 13 equals 39. So what the Masoretes actually copied was our Old Testament. So they attested to the fact that that was the canon of the, of the Old Testament. Pretty fascinating stuff, right? Pretty fascinating. How do I know if the canon of the Old Testament is part of the scriptures breathed out by God? So now this kind of really goes into um, how do I know that these are inspired by God, right? So let's look at, we, we really don't have to look further than this, but Jesus testified to their authenticity, It comes down to what Jesus says about it. Now, part of apologetics is knowing your audience, right? Knowing my audience, we're in a room, and on Zoom, we're, we're surrounded by professing believers in Jesus Christ, right? So we, we profess Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, right? So if we're going to profess Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we have to take the words that he says as valid, right, and as true, 
And so let's look at what Jesus says about the word. Luke 24, 44. Um, let's see, Hannah, you, you mind reading that? From the packet is fine. Then he said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Amen. So if you remember last week when we talked about Jesus speaking about the inspiration of the scriptures, he said one of the things was the word, the scriptures point to who? Him, right? He said they point to me. Right? And what's interesting here is that the, everything that's written about him is the law of Moses, the law, the Pentateuch, the prophets, right? major and minor, and it says the Psalms here, but really what he's talking about is the writings. What are the three divisions that the Masoretes used? The law, the prophets, and the writings, right? So Jesus is claiming that the Old Testament books that the Masoretes actually recognize as canon are indeed canon. And that's good enough for me. Is it good enough for you? Yep. It's good enough for you. And I could go one verse even further. Matthew 5, 17 and 18 says this. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. So not only does he say that these are the inspired word of God, he's saying that even the little brushes, the little notes on the text that distinguish one Hebrew word from another, they are all important and they are all totally accurate. Amen? So with that, with full confidence, I can declare that the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, is our Old Testament. The canon of scripture for the Old Testament is closed. We're not going to add to it. We're not going to take away from it. In fact, all throughout scripture, he says, don't add to my word. Don't take away from my word, right? So we're not going to. So now let's turn our eyes to the New Testament. All right. So we're going to turn our eyes to the New Testament. We're going to try and get through this so that we can get home at some point. We only have about 10 more pages to go, but it's good, right? There has been a major misunderstanding of how the canon has come to be considered closed, right? And it's really no, one thing that's very important to note, nobody, um, there's nobody out there that disagrees with the Old Testament canon. There, there is very much, there's very few people. It's the New Testament canon that is actually more um, debated, all right? And, and and even now, today, it's not really debated anymore. It's, it's, pretty, it's clear. So after we're done going through the rest of this for the New Testament, my prayer is that you and I would all leave here tonight and, and we would be fully convinced that this is indeed the word of God, nothing more, nothing less. All right? So closed means it is complete. The 66 books of the Bible are, are the books God intended to complete the scripture. No more and no less. Norm Geisler and William Nix, they suggest this thought is a major fallacy as it fails to distinguish between determination and recognition of canon. So the two things we're, we're, we're deciding between determination and recognition of canon. Does man determine what the canon is? No. Does man recognize what the canon is? That's the key, right? So what Norm Geisler and William Nix, actually, they, they, they have this paper, and what they're really saying is that the people who are struggling with the canon of Scripture, they're struggling because they don't understand the difference between determination and recognition. Man did not determine the Scripture. Man recognized the Scripture. So with books like the Da Vinci Code out there, who, who talks about the Council of Nicaea and all this stuff, and um, how they just decided, oh, we're going to put this one in. We're not going to put this. That's not how it actually went down. That's not how it went down. And we can be very confident that that's not how. The formation of the New Testament took over 300 years as it starts with the written scriptures themselves and is finalized circa AD 400. So before 400, it was finalized. So it took over 300 years.
So the, the history of the canon explores, so Roger Nicole says this, the history of the canon explores the course of acceptance and rejection amongst God, among God's people, takes note of the hesitations, the consensus, and the occasional errors of Jews and Christians. So what was happening is there were many writings. Do you know how many writings there were that claimed to be divinely inspired? Does anybody know? Good, me neither. But I know that there were more than what's in our canon of Scripture, right? And so what was happening is um, you had like the gospel according to Thomas. There, there's a whole list of actual books that claim divinity, right? They claim to be divinely inspired. But, but as the Christian communities were reading it, they said, this, this isn't God. This isn't, this isn't what God says. And, and what do we know about Scripture? Does what God say in Genesis, does it ever contradict what he says in Revelation or anywhere else in Scripture? Does God's word ever, does, it, does he ever contradict himself? No, and we know that. How do we get to that conclusion? Well, can we do that on our own ability? No. Who's helping us all along the way? The Holy Spirit, right? So the Holy Spirit is the one who is guiding this transaction. He's guiding this. And, and what's going on is the churches are either accepting these documents, these written texts, or they're rejecting them, right? And so that's, that's what it's going over. And it's going over their um, hesitations, and it's, it's the consensus. And so what's happening also is this. We have a small church here in Friendship, right? Now, somebody can write a book that really speaks to us here at Friendship, right? And it, and it can really move us here in South Jersey, right? But if we take that same book and we give it to somebody in maybe Africa, right? Is it really going to speak to them the same way? Is it going to speak to them at all, right? And so what's happening is there are some books that are speaking to a local body of church, but it's not a universal um, literature. It's not universal according to the, the whole church, right? So you have local church versus the church. And so if it's not acceptable for the church and only acceptable for small little pockets, it cannot be included in scripture. And that's what they're doing. That's what they're getting together. And that's what they're discussing. All right. Uh, when the canonization of scripture was completed, the church recognized the Holy scriptures as divine, divine. And that's what we're after, right? What books are divinely inspired and what books aren't, right? And if it's not divinely inspired, it doesn't mean we can't read it. It doesn't mean it can't help us in our faith, right? Like, I'm sure we all read C.S. Lewis but how, or, or J.I. Packer or Bruce or all these different um, writers, right? And, and we say, hey, it really helps us with our faith, but would we ever say that it was divinely inspired? Absolutely not, right? So the inspired books are the ones that are in canon. Everything else is not. All right. Um, for lack of time, you guys, I, I would I would suggest you guys go and read what J.I. Packer and Bruce, uh, F.F. Bruce say about this. Uh, but we're going to go um, a little bit further down. And the the church, implying that the church simply chose what books they wanted to impose is in error, all right? So the, to say that the church chose certain books would be wrong. They didn't pick and choose, Ken. They didn't pick and choose, oh, you're in, you're out. It wasn't, um, what was that? Um, you, you take a flower and, right, right, Harry? She loves me, she loves you not. It wasn't that, right? It wasn't, oh, she loves me, Paul, she loves you not. It wasn't that. It was, it was very serious consideration. Um, the church did not determine canonicity, rather they recognized canonicity of the 27 books as they were divine in origin. If, if I'm going to get anything across to you tonight, it's the difference between determination and recognition. Um, I'm going to repeat it. Why? Because it's so important. They did not determine the scriptures. They recognized the scriptures. And there's a huge, huge difference. Even just in speaking it, you can hear that there's a huge difference, right? Could, could I just say something, Chess? Absolutely. Um, so the scriptures were 
the scriptures as soon as they were God breathed. Amen. It was years later that they recognized them, but it didn't become scripture when they recognized them. They they were already scripture. The the letter that Paul wrote to the Romans was inspired by God, and, and, and from the moment that he wrote it, um, the fact that the church officially declared Romans as a part of the the Bible is them recognizing the work that God had already done. Amen. Amen. That I mean, I can't put it better than that. Right. The, the scriptures were scriptures the moment they came out. Um, Josh McDowell declares there are not more than 5,686 known Greek manuscripts. Would you say that's a big number? Right? There are more than that, right? Um, of the New Testament. Add over 10,000 Latin Vulgate, Latin Vulgate, and at least 9,300 other early versions. And we have close to, if not more than, 25,000 manuscript copies or por of portions of the New Testament in existence today. That's a lot. That's a lot. Um, think about it. For that time period, that's a lot. That's a lot of handwriting. Um, that's a lot of cramp. Anybody get cramps when they're writing? Like, how many of you guys kind of cramped up when you were writing this homework? Um, you guys that didn't type it, you wrote it out. You're like getting hand cramps and whatnot. That's a lot. By mere number, the amount of surviving manuscripts today is evidence of God's preservation of his word. Right? There is no lack of evidence for God pre preserving his word. That is clear cut. God has preserved his word. In fact, no other document of antiquity even begins to approach such a number. The Homer, how many of you guys have ever heard Homer? Homer's Iliad is the second closest, right? It's the second closest as far as manuscripts go. And it only has, it's not, I don't want to say it only has. I mean, this is a pretty big number. 643 manuscripts that still survive. Chad? Right? Yeah. Isn't there about the same for... Um for Aristotle and writings by Aristotle, and yet folks tend to hold that in high regard, whereas there's 24, 25,000 of the yeah. Bible. Yeah. I just thought that was interesting. Yeah, I, I think that's fantastic it's, as well, right? I mean, Aristotle, and, and really what really shocks you about this is the time gap between them as well. And I didn't even bring this up into this, you know? Uh, the time gap for them is astronomically different, right? Homer's, um, I think the time gap for what, when Homer lived, right, to when it was written was like about a thousand years. Um, the time gap between when, the, when Jesus was alive and the scriptures came out was between 50 to 60, 50 to 90 years. So within one generation, right? So it was in the lifetime of the apostles. It was in the lifetime of, Within the lifetime of the writers themselves is when we're finding our, our earliest manuscripts. Um, one of the ones DG started bringing up, Alexander the Great. How many of you guys know who Alexander the Great is? Right? Um, how do you know who Alexander the Great is? History. History. Do you believe that Alexander the Great was a real historical person? Yeah. Why? History tells us. Right? There, the, I believe that Alexander the Great is a historical person. I'm not saying he's not. But what I will tell you this is there's only 27 manuscripts about Alexander the Great's life. And it was not even close as far as the time gap. I think it was like 1,500 years after the life of Alexander the Great. Right? And if you really look at the, the story of Alexander the Great, what he did actually paved the way for the Bible um, because he brought the Greek lifestyle. It became uh, Koine Greek was the 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 language that the world pretty much spoke at that time, right? And, and so the majority of the New Testament was written in Koine Greek. How many manuscripts were up to 1900? About 27. Yep. So uh, Iliad is second with only 643. So the attention to detail to, of those copying the manuscripts to those who were placed in charge of 
to maintain their preservation, demonstrate the Holy Spirit's guiding the process. The Holy Spirit guiding the process of the New Testament canon. So the Holy Spirit is absolutely influential and necessary for the preservation of the Word of God. Right? And why is that? Because God is perfectly in unity with himself, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And the role of the Holy Spirit was to testify to truth. So what do we have today that testifies to truth? Well, it's the word of God. Um, we're going to skip down. Old Testament is the next blank. But we're going to talk a little bit. Why do we need the canon of the New Testament? I think this is pretty simple as to why um, we need the, I think we can all kind of infer. Why did we need the canon of the New Testament? Um, but we're going to talk about Marcion, the Marcion controversy just a little bit. Um, so during the early church, certain heresies led the church to recognize the canon. And, and the first was the, 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 the big one was the Marcion controversy. And, and what it was is there was Gnostic teachers were the first to question and challenge the church specifically on how the scriptures should be interpreted. Right? Gnostic. That's G-N-O-S-T-I-C. The Gnostic teachers, right? Um, 31. 31. The first blank is old. Or can. Synonymous, right? Nobody got it. Okay. <laughs> I cracked myself up. All right. So in, a <laughs> in AD 140, Marcion, who was deemed a heretic, would construct his own canon. So this guy came along, and he's going to construct his own canon of the New Testament. How does that sound? That sounds pretty horrible to me, right? I'm going to, hey, listen up, guys. I'm going to come, and I'm going to look at these texts, and I'm going to decide what the canon of Scripture is, all right? And this is really why we need it. We need the canon, right? We need it. We don't need people coming in arbitrarily saying what is and what is not canon. We needed God. We needed God to say these are the scriptures. We needed God to, to use godly men to recognize the scriptures so that we know what the scriptures are today. All right. And so what he did was he excluded Matthew, Mark, and John. He excluded Matthew, Mark, and John altogether. Why? He didn't like them. He didn't like what they had to say. Right? And while recognizing portions of Luke. And this is interesting, right? Uh, because each of the Gospels had their own little different bent, right? And that's why we have all four, because they all have a different bent. And Luke actually was historical in nature, whereas the others were not as historical, right? So what he would do is he would kind of take the histor history out of it, but the spiritual aspect, eh, get rid of it. And so he would exclude others uh, because they were inconsistent with his beliefs. So he was excluding Matthew, Mark, and John because it, was, it, it didn't go along with his beliefs. Going further, he only recognized 10 of Paul's letters, excluding the pastorals, but even the, of the ones he recognized, he abbreviated them on his belief that an alien had, alien hand corrupted the Paul had corrupted the, that should say had, I don't know why it's hand, but an alien had corrupted the Pauline letters. So now we're getting into aliens, right? Um, and, and what's not clear is, is it like an alien or is it like a foreigner? I think he's meaning foreigner. Um, so a foreigner has corrupted the Pauline letters. So somebody came in and added to Paul's letters. So really, what is he doing? He's taking out what he likes and keeping that as scripture. And anything he doesn't like, get rid of it, right? And, and now we know that the gospels, the writings of Jesus, the sayings of Jesus, they're hard truths, right? So where it says, hey, if you want to follow me, deny yourself, pick up your cross daily, and then follow me, guess what? Not in there, right? Get out of there. He who loves mother, father, sister, brother more than me is not worthy of me. Guess what? Not in there, right? Um, what is in there? I don't know what he would assume is in there because to me, the scriptures are all tough, right? They're, they're all convicting. Um, so 
So he, he had just abbreviated them. And going further, he rejected the Old Testament based on his profound dislike of Judaism. And he had a dual view of deity, believing that God was not the same God in the Old Testament as he is in the New Testament. How many times have we heard that? Right? I mean, I'll be honest with you. I, I grew up as a, a believer at a young age, but I didn't really understand, right? It wasn't until I got older that I started to really understand scripture better, right? And so I remember as a kid listening to the Bible stories, Sodom and Gomorrah, Oh, God, <laughs> hellfire and brimstone, right? And then all of a sudden, the next week is God loves you so much. Like, that sounds like two different gods to me, right? So it's kind of understandable that, that it's like, depending on how it's taught, right, how the scriptures are taught, you can, you can easily come to that conclusion that there's two different gods, right? But if you're under good, solid teaching, you recognize that, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, right? He is immutable. He does not change. So the God of the Old Testament is the same God of the New Testament, right? Um, and so because God of the Old Testament and the New Testament were different, right? And the God of the New Testament is grace. The God of the Old Testament is law. He, let's just reject the Old Testament completely. How does that sound? Pretty fascinating, right? So wouldn't you say the church needed to respond? So, and that's really where this came about, right? The church had already been recognizing the scriptures all along the way. But when Markion came, they said, hey, we got to come together and we have to, this is why they developed councils. This is why they, they said, hey, let's have the confessions, right? Let's have these things because we need to just blatantly downright say that's a heresy Europe. <coughs> We want nothing to do with you, right? And so the church quickly accepted the four gospels. The church quickly accepted. It, there was no debate over the four gospels whatsoever. They, they said, yep, they are absolutely scripture. They are absolutely God-breathed. Uh, the same thing with the book of Acts, <laughs> the Pauline epistles. So the four gospels <laughs> and the Pauline epistles quickly accepted. The, the books of the first blank is 1st and 2nd Peter, James, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and Jude. They would all be recognized pretty much without debate as well, right? It didn't take much debate for them as well. Um, clear, they're in, right? 1st and 2nd Peter, 1, 2, Peter, James, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John and Jude. So they would all be recognized without much debate as well. Now, John's revelation, however, uh, was questioned by many. Why? Because it's unusual style and ap apocalyptic content, but it would also eventually be received as canon. So I, I can understand that, right? And, and you know what that says to me is that they took the job serious, right? They, they took the job serious. They weren't just going to say, well, the Apostle John wrote it, and that's the only criteria, and so we're just going to bring it in. No, they, they distinguished, and they, they said, all right, let's make sure the Apostle John wrote this. Let's make sure not just that he wrote this, but that this was a divine, in, divinely inspired letter, right? Let me ask you a question. Do you think Paul wrote other letters? He wrote other letters. Absolutely, right? Um, why are they not considered divinely inspired, whereas the 13 letters are? Subject matter, right? The nature of it. Again, it goes down to this. It, it may only be for a local person, right? If it's not for the universal church, right? It's not, God, it's not divinely inspired. Yeah. The only personal letter he wrote was to uh, Philemon. In Scripture in scripture, right? So in scripture, but to say that's the only personal letter he wrote would be absolutely false. He's written many letters, right? Many letters. In fact, there's times where he says, I've written you before, right? And that's not even in scripture, right? And so it, it, like this was a serious task, right? 
And, th- and this is how they would do it. Paul would write a letter, or John would write a letter, or Peter would write a letter, and the church would receive the letter, and they would preach from that letter, right? And so that was scripture, right? So when they're receiving it, it's scripture, and they're, they're teaching it. There's, there's apostolic teaching in there, all right? Um, the list of accepted canonical scriptures known as the Moratorian list in AD 170 consisted of a canon of New Testament that is very much like the recognized canon today, as it included 21 of 27 books. Not only was the book of Acts greatly received, but Bruce actually says the book of Acts was vital for the canonization of the rest of the New Testament. And why would that be? Think about it. The book of Acts, right? How much of the book of Acts actually accounted for Thessalonica, um, what was happening in these other places, right? Um, Second, first and second Peter. Peter is actually accounted for in the book of Acts, Acts 15, talking about the council of uh, Jerusalem, right? And all these different things. So uh, the book of Acts being quickly accepted as canon and recognized as canon um, helped out with the rest of the books um, in many ways. Um, so the influential church fathers in the canonized of the New Testament. Um, the first stage of developing the New Testament canon was through the transition from oral to written form of the Christian message, right? Started out oral, and then it went to written form. And this was known as the scripture principle. The sayings of Jesus and the apostles were preserved both in oral and written forms. Evidence of the scripture's authority was displayed in that Clement of Rome, Ignatius of Antioch, Polycarp, um, they all quoted from Paul's letters. So these are early church fathers, and they're all quoting from Paul's letters, right? And, and, and they're, they're all quoting saying, thus saith the Lord, right? Scripture says. So they're, they're claiming divine, divine origin as they're quoting it. It wasn't just like a, a happenstance where they're quoting. It's they are, they are saying this is what scripture says, God says. And it was around 170 that Tadian's Diatessaron gave a comp, composite of the four gospel accounts. It was accepted for a long time by the Syriac church, which seems to argue that it was a compilation of authoritative books. Right? And so, so what we're getting at is these early church leaders, they didn't argue over what was Scripture and what was not. They, re, they recognized what was truly Scripture all along the way. Continuing further, Polycarp, Ignatius, Irenaeus, Clement of Alexandria, different than the one of Rome, held to a threefold standard for authority being. And this is what they said, the prophets, the Lord, and the apostles. Right? So the prophets, that includes the Old Testament, right? The Lord, Jesus Christ himself, and the apostles. Anything from them is divinely inspired, divine in nature. It was around 180 that Tertullian wrote his prescription against heretics in which he presented an argument concerned with who has the right to the Christian Christian scriptures. Irenaeus, during the last two decades of the second century, used scripture from both the Old and the New Testament to build his writings. He goes through the words of Jesus, the Gospels, Acts, the letters of Paul, and other apostolic writings in order to refute the heretics. So what is he doing? He's doing exactly what we need to be doing, right? He's using scripture to articulate and defend his cause right? And it's not his cause, it's the cause of God, right? So when we see heretics and we hear heresy, we don't say it's heresy because we think it's heresy. We say it's heresy because the word of God declares it's heresy, right? And that's exactly what um, the early church fathers did. He was further involved in arguing against Marcion, right? We know about that guy, right? No, not that great. Um, and other Gnostic leaders, by affirming the authority of only four Gospels. How many Gospels? Four. So th- when you hear, oh, there's other Gospels. Nope. There's four Gospels. Four Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. All of this led to the morator- moratorium fragment. And it was here that 
it recognized nearly all the New Testament books we have today, except Hebrews, James, 1st and 2nd Peter, and perhaps one letter of John. So if you notice, we're getting much closer. We're, we're dwindling down, and we're getting to where are, where are all the books, right? We're getting closer to the 27 at this point, right? There were many other early church fathers who added to the defense of the canonization of the New Testament and helped recognize the books we claim today. They did not simply compile a list, but they endorsed the scriptures as authoritative in their daily dealings. So they, they didn't compile it. They endorsed the scriptures, um, all culminating in Athanasius' Easter letter in 367. And this is where it includes all and all of and only the 27 books of the New Testament canon. So this was the first time, as you remember, I stated, um, Athanasius was the first one that included all and only the 27 books of the New Testament canon. So the criteria for canonization, this is where it becomes even more like, okay, now we have objective facts. Why is this? the canon of scripture. So the criteria for canonization. Additionally, the need for canonization of the New Testament arose out of the gospel being rapidly spread, right? The Great Commission told us, go to all the earth, right? And so if you're going to take the message to all the earth, all the earth needs to be able to receive and read the scriptures, right? So in order for that to happen, when you have all these different languages, you have to start translating them, right? And so for these translators, without the canon being finalized, the translators would not know what books they should and should not be translating, right? The translators. So in all the list of recognized scriptures as authoritative, there were criteria that the early church fathers were following. There were many documents to go through, many different heretical writings, and many that didn't measure up to being divinely inspired. We, we talked about that, right? There's many writings, right? And again, they're not just saying, oh, Ken wrote this, throw it away. Harry wrote this, it must be true. They're not doing that, right? They're going through the test. They're reading it, they're dissecting it, and they're prayerfully considering each of them, right? Um, some of them much easier to tell than others, right? Some of them were much quicker. Up oh, here it is. That's not canon. Get it out of here. Um, the criteria for determining canonicity are difficult to determine precisely. Some books were quickly and widely received. Others appear to have been severely questioned and little used. Paul tells us in 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is breathed out by God. In other words, all scripture is divinely inspired. So this process, for some books, quick, easy. For other books, it was a little bit more difficult, right? Hebrews, why would Hebrews be a little bit more difficult? Right? Hebrews did not have a name for the writer attached to it, right? But it's so clear that Hebrews is written by a church leader. And it's so clear that Hebrews has apostolic authority to it. In fact, many early church leaders actually attribute Paul to be the writer of Hebrews, right? That's a different discussion for a different day. But so Hebrews was one of those, it was harder. And as you, you can tell, it was harder to um, just put in without, they had to discuss it. They discussed it more and more. Uh, a biconditional statement can be used to summarize what Paul is asserting. And here it is. Whatever God inspired is scripture. Amen? And whatever God did not inspire is not scripture. So a biconditional statement, if he inspired it, it is scripture. If he did not inspire it, it is not scripture. And the three criteria that were used were apostolicity, right? It's the next heading if you don't know how to spell it. Apostolicity, orthodoxy, and universality. You like those words? It kind of makes me feel like I'm smart when I say it. Yeah. <laughs> Apostolicity, orthodoxy. Look at the next page. 
O R T H O D O X Y. And universality. U N I V E R S A L I T Y. So apostolicity is are they tied to an apostle? That's pretty much the, the, the quickest way I can say. Is it the apostle himself wrote it or somebody who is a known associate of the apostle write it? So in the Great Commission, Jesus tells his disciples, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. So what did Jesus do with his authority? He gave his authority to the apostles. And for a New Testament book to be recognized as canonical, it had to have been written with apostolic authority. All right? So it had to have apostolic authority. So that is either the apostle himself wrote the book or someone known to be a close associate wrote the book. So this is such as Mark. Mark was a close associate of Peter um, and Luke, who was a close associate of Paul, right? So Mark and Luke, they were not one of the original 12, right? But they were close. And, and the church recognized, these councils recognized that they were close. They, they, they were taking their eyewitness account and writing it down, right? So it was very important that only those who had witnessed the events themselves or recorded the eyewitness accounts be considered divine in origin. So, so they had to have seen it themselves or in Luke's case, had to have somebody, who, they're taking the account of somebody who saw it, right? So it's an eyewitness account, right? Geisler and Nick suggest that this means each book of the New Testament canon was either authored by an apostle or has apostolic teaching, which then commends apostolic authority. And so eyewitness testimony is evidenced in the kerygma, which is the, the church's proclamation of Christ, right? The kerygma is the, the proclamation of the gospel, right? Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 6, that more than 500 people saw the resurrected Christ at the same time. The authenticity of scripture was backed up by the corroboration of the eyewitnesses. Precisely, one can be confident in the books that have been recognized as the canon of the New Testament because they pass the authorship criteria and stand up against eyewitness accounts. What would happen if... They, Paul said 500 people saw this, right? And somebody's reading it. So if, if Paul said it and DG's reading it and he's like, hold up. If 500 people saw this, I should be able to go find somebody that saw it, right? And if I can't find anybody that saw it, well, what you said was wrong, right? They stood up against eyewitness account. They couldn't do that because they went and they said, hey, did you see it? No, I didn't see it, but my buddy Brian did. Oh, Brian, did you see? Yeah, I saw. It was, whoa. You know, and so it passed the eyewitness accounts. Geisler and Nick's continue. There is good evidence that all 27 books of the New Testament come from the apostles and their associates. The apostolicity of the book in consideration is one of grave importance, and each of the 27 books passed the test of the criterion. Right? Each of those books passed that test. Now, that test is... Yes. Can I say one thing? No. Uh, well, okay. Um, this uh, helps us understand why a book written years later, let's say 600 years later, uh, could not be scripture uh, because it had to be, the authority was given to the apostles. Those apostles lived in the first century and they, their record is the New Testament. If anything was written afterwards, any additional books that were written afterwards are actually false uh, gospels or false scriptures because it had to be written under the authority of the, the authority was given to the apostles, not to their great, 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 great grandchildren, right? Yeah. 
And, and that even brings up like Polycarp. Polycarp was a known associate of John, right? Um, but, but he lived much later than John did, right? Like he was a young man while John was an old man. So that's like kind of me with, I'm not going to say, but some of the factors here. Um, yeah. <laughs> so so we look at, for example, the Quran or the Book of Mormon or other books that were written centuries later, they cannot be part of scripture because the authority was given to the apostles. And it was in their lifetime too. And so what I was getting at is Polycarp was a known associate of John and Polycarp wrote a lot of other letters, right? And letters that we look back to as far as, you know, defending our faith and everything, but they're not scripture, right? Why? Well, it wasn't, they weren't, in, they weren't written in the lifetime of, of the apostles. So even Polycarp recognized that, hey, what I'm writing is not divine. This is divine scripture. This is divine um, so the next one is orthodoxy. The second criteria is orthodoxy. And, and so what this means is it must, must teach principles that the church regarded as correct. Orthodoxy is correct living, right? Or correct doctrine. Orthopraxy is correct living. Um, so orthodoxy, it must teach correct um, things. And so Carson and Moose state, one basic requirement for canonicity was conformity to the rule of faith, conformity between the document and orthodoxy, that is Christian truth recognized as normative in the churches. So it had to fall under the rule of faith. So it, if, if, so Paul says in Timothy, make sure that your lifestyle and your doc doctrine are matching closely. Well, where are you getting that doctrine from? right? It's from the scriptures. And God is not an author of confusion of chaos, but he's consistent in all that he says and does, right? And so his doctrines are not just in one book. It's throughout the scripture, right? So in order for it to pass the test, it had to have the correct teaching, right? And we know um, we can read a book, right? What, what distinguishes us from a book? There are Christian books out there, Christian books that are highly heretical, right? And we read them and we say, that is not true, right? What, what, what enables us to know that? Well, we know what's true because the Bible tells us, but we also have the Holy Spirit confirming what is truth, all right? Um, I think I'm losing some time here. Sorry, guys. Um, so the rule of faith. Paul in his letter to the Galatians speaks of scripture conforming to the rule of faith. Um, I'm going to let you guys read those verses later, but um, scripture is very clear that you have to conform to the rule of faith. There, there's consistency in the scripture. So orthodoxy was uh, uh, another criteria. And the third one is universality, which we discussed. Um, you guys can go ahead and read that on your own. Um, I don't have any more blanks for you guys, but we discussed universality throughout, right? That's if, if Friendship Bible has a book like Pastor John, George, Chris, they, they all like to write books, Right. Maybe one day I'll write a book. I don't know. Maybe this will become a book. I don't know. Um, but they all like to write books. And those books could be highly beneficial for us, right? But it's not necessarily going to be beneficial for the, the, the whole church, right? Even, in, even another church in EHT might not find what they're writing to be beneficial for their soul, right? And so if it's, if it's only for a small um, local body, local gathering, and not for the universal church, then it's not divinely inspired because you're putting God in a box, right? When God says something, it goes for everybody, right? It goes for everybody. It's, it's practical for everybody and it's orthodoxical for everybody. Um, and so that's how we got the finalization of the canon, right? It was uh, with the inspiration of scriptures being highly attested by the following above criteria, right? Um, the canon eventually became finalized from the canon suggested by Marcion to the moratorium fragment to Athanasius' festal or Easter letter in 367. The canon was closed in Carthage in 397. That's when the canon of scripture was closed. It is not debated anymore. Now you have the, the Catholics. That's a whole different story when they come in and start to say, hey, let's add the Apocrypha in there and, and whatnot. But for us, we know with certainty that the canon of scripture is closed. Uh, and again, there, there's so many different resources on this, guys, and you guys can read till your brain hurts. Um, I know putting it together, my brain hurt 
a lot. <laughs> I had some headaches uh, trying to put all this together. But, uh, but my prayer was that, you know, maybe, maybe I haven't fully convinced you that the 66 books that we have are the canon of Scripture, but I, my prayer is that I at least brought you closer to that conclusion. Amen. Uh, any comments? That, that's it for today. Um, any comments, questions, statements of fact? Mary? Amen. Amen. Jim. I, I think it bolsters the idea of believing that God's word is true. That you have men that wrote these books of the Bible, but you have also had other men investigating and evaluating Amen. and making it a part of God's word because they also believed that it was true. Amen. So. There's a lot of checks and balances, right? DG. I just like how you brought out the fact it's important to use words correctly, right? Yeah. And how you brought out how they they recognize the scripture, they didn't determine what the scripture was. So yeah, it's very important as far as using the proper words when you're speaking about. It. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, you know, when, when you're, if you're ever in a debate about this, I guarantee you the person who's arguing against the canon of scripture is using the terminology, they determined it, right? And that's a surefire way to turn it right around. No, they did not determine it. They recognized it, right? And that's where the, the real argument lies is between determination and recognition. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, how about you guys online? Anybody? Rose, you still with us? Hi, Rose. Hey, Carol. How are you? I'm um, great. <laughs> all right. So, Brian. Wow. So what the Pope says is, is divinely inspired. Yeah. Wow. Interesting. Uh, how about you guys online? Anything? Um, I think I already asked that, right? I want to discuss the, what was that, Hannah? I was just going to say when, before when Rose and I and, John, we're, we're talking and we were saying how a lot of like the we were grow, grew up Catholic and I had no idea any of the stuff about adding the scriptures or um, the uh, you know the any anything like that I had had we were like just saying that we had no idea that that was even a thing because they never really you know uh, proclaimed that or or let it you know told people like oh this is we added these books. Like I literally did not know that. So it's just crazy how, you know, sometimes we can be pretty ignorant in our faith. <laughs> like when you're going, you know, when you're Catholic like that, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, we were all, you know, I, I don't think you're the only one in that, but I think a lot of us kind of felt that way, you know, and why do you believe? Well, it was told to me. That's why I believe it. One of the things we were sharing uh, was that, um, what when we went to church growing up, there might be a five or ten minute homily, uh, just a little teeny uh, snack of a message, and uh, I was left wanting more, you know, uh, and what and just curious. Uh, and so it's great to go to a Bible church where you, you know, where you're hearing the Word of God explained, and um, you know that's really the authority. Amen. Praise God. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you guys.
uh, it's encouraging to me to know that you guys are, are growing in your faith because of this. Absolutely. That's that. I mean, that's why we're doing this, right? It, it's, it's so that we can edify each other and that we can grow together. Um, if you want to take a look to the last page, your homework, I, I just want to, I want to discuss it with you real quick. Um, it's, it's a simple homework assignment, but there, there's a, a couple steps to it. The first one is you're going to watch a video. How many of you guys know who Bill O'Reilly is? So Bill O'Reilly, he had a, a guy by the name of Richard Dawkins on one night, and uh, Richard Dawkins wrote The God Delusion. That sounds like a great book, right? Um, and so he wrote The God Delusion, and so Bill O'Reilly thought he was going to bring him on, and he was going to debate him. So it's a four minute, it's about four minutes and 40, 41 seconds, um, where he's talking to Richard Dawkins, and he's kind of going back and forth with Richard Dawkins, but... But I, I don't want to give too much away because I, I don't want to lead you guys into where I think you should go in, in receiving this message. Um, but my, my thoughts are I would like you guys to watch the video, right? It's four minutes and 41 seconds. Watch the video. And then I, I want you to answer these questions. Do you agree with Bill O'Reilly and how he conducted himself and in what he was saying? Um, do you, how would you have responded to Richard Dawkins? And then I'd like you to look up 1 Peter 3.15 and discuss whether or not Bill O'Reilly responded appropriately. All right. Um, so, yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll email the link out. Yep. Um, you could also type it in, but I'll, I'll email it out. Yeah, for sure. Um, and so you're going you're gonna to watch it um, and really come to your own conclusions. Again, like the homework again. I, I don't want to give you cookie cutter answers and I don't want cookie cutter responses. So I'm not going to lead you one way or the other and what to say. Um, but any questions on what you're doing for this week? All right. Uh, DJ, would you mind closing us in prayer, brother? Uh, my, my pleasure. Thank Let's you. Pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for this time together. Lord, thank you for our brother bringing us uh, some important truths and, and helping us understand better uh, how we got your word. We do thank you so much that we did get your word. Thank you that we can bank on it, Lord, that we can look to you and you speak through your word uh, even now. Mm. Lord, I ask you, please, uh, those that are driving, take them home safe. Those are already home, Lord, please give them a good night. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, guys. Great night. See you guys. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Bye. We'll see you guys next. Yeah. Bye. One more. See you, Hannah. Thank you.